Uh, my name is Tony McAvoy. Uh, I'm a lawyer by trade. My people are the Ruddy people from central Queensland. I am currently in the position of acting treaty commissioner uh, for the Northern Territory of Australia. And I come to you today for, from the lands of the Larrakia people in, in what is uh, now the city of Darwin. I, I pay my deepest respects to the Larrakia people, uh, their elders, their ancestors, and their spirits. Uh, they have suffered uh, the worst of British colonization in this part of the continent, um, but they remain strong and resolute in their quest for justice. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands from which our panelists and, and members of our audience uh, are joining from. The topic for today's uh, panel is treaties global context towards treaty in the Northern Territory. The purpose of today's gathering is to talk about the process of settler state First Nations treaties from a broader global perspective in the hope of giving some insight to the very unique opportunity that presents itself for the First Nations of the Northern Territory of Australia. It was intended that the NT Minister for Treaty, the Honour Honourable Selina Uber, would join the panel, um, but she is unable to join us due, due to her ministerial responsibilities and uh, sends her apologies. However, this panel is the first in a two-part series uh, relating to the Northern Territory. The second part is proposed to be a live panel on Larrakia country in May, 2022, after the Treaty Commissioner's report has been delivered to Minister Ubo, uh, and after Minister Ubo has had some time to digest it. Uh, and that panel will be composed of all uh, NT Northern Territory speakers. The Importance of this uh, treaty process in the NT, in the Northern Territory of Australia, is, is made uh, very clear when you consider the extraordinary panel that has made itself available to discuss treaties with us today. Uh, I will first introduce the Honourable Minister, uh, Nanaya Mahuta. You'll see from her, uh, from the introductory material, that uh, Minister Mahuta or Nanaya, as she's asked me to call her and I will oblige, uh, is she is of the Waikara Tanui, uh, Iwi, and the Ngāti Maniapoto and Ngāti Manu. Uh, she is the Aotearoa Foreign, Foreign Affairs Minister and has, uh, in her time in Parliament, supported policies and initiatives that have built capacity, the capacity of communities, especially social service organisations, uh, greater investment in education, employment, training opportunities, and supported the continuation of the treaty, treaty settlement process and supported specific initiatives that lift the well-being and opportunities for, for young mothers and those who are vulnerable to victims of, and victims of abuse. Next, I will uh, introduce Justice uh, Sir Joseph Williams, or Joe Williams, uh, as, as he is known, um, of the Supreme Court of New Zealand. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, of course, for those in Australia and abroad, uh, is, the, is the equivalent of the Australian High Court and the highest uh, court uh, in New Zealand. Justice uh, Williams has had a stellar legal career as a lawyer uh, involved in uh, treaty law. Uh, he, in 1999, he became the Chief Judge of the Māori Land Court, and was appointed a Chairperson of the Waitangi Tribunal shortly after in 2000. He was made the chairperson of the Waitangi Tribunal in 2004, and uh, Justice uh, Williams was appointed to the High Court in 2008. Um, a, a judge of the Court of Appeal in February 2018, and a judge of the Supreme Court in May 2019. Justice Williams, Iwi, uh, Nati Kenga, uh, Wataha, and uh, Tapuika, Tapiika. Sorry, sorry, Judge, and. Um, um, and finally, uh, uh, but definitely not least, we have Professor John Burrows, who has joined us from uh, Vancouver Island on the west coast of North America uh, in Canada. Um, who, uh, jo Professor John Burrows and I uh, last uh, spoke together on a panel on, uh, on Thursday Island uh, in the Torres Strait Island about uh, 
regional autonomy for the Torres Straits. Um, and I had the pleasure of his company for a number of days while we were hosted at the Torres Straits. He is a, a Chippewa man of the Nawash uh, uh, area and uh, is the Canadian uh, Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria Law School in British Columbia. Um, I welcome you all and I invite you, uh, I will invite you each in turn just to say a few words of welcome yourself um, to, to our audience, um, as such as they are. Um, I might start uh, with uh, Professor Burroughs. I'm from the Otter Clan, uh, from the Chippewa the Nawash First Nation, Neashi Winigaming, which is about three and a half hours north of Toronto, four and a half hours north of Detroit in the Great Lakes area of the country. Uh, as mentioned, though, I'm speaking to you from Vancouver Island, New Channel Territory today in the Pacific Rim. Uh, National Park, and I'm grateful for the invitation and look forward to speaking with everyone this evening. Um, thank, thank you, um, John. Um, uh, I, I might ask uh, uh, Nanaya uh, next. Uh, um, as was said, my name's Nanaya. Uh, I'm from the Waikato Manyaputo. We're a river people where I was raised for most of my life. And uh, on my mother's side, we hear it from the north where the sun only shines. Kia ora. Pleased to be a part of the panel. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, and Justice Williams. Tēnā koe Tony, tēnā, uh, tēnā noho ki koe John Yahumaira i te, i te kāinga o te honu nunui uh, me te tuahine rā hoki o roto waikato. Tēnā koe utau. Tēnā hoki tātau uh, kei ngā me pēnea ke pēa kei ngā tāngata o te kōlaha. Kei ngā tāngata o te ngāhere, kei ngā tāngata o te moana. Katoa o tēni takiwā o koutou o te pāpaka nui. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā ki koutou te āhua ki o tā taumate. E hinga ana, e hinga tonu ana, e tangihia tonu nei, e tangihia tonu nei. Mātau ia o te aroa nei, koutou i te wāhi o te, te honu, koutou ano hoki. O te pāpaka nui haere ngā mate haere. Um, firstly, greetings to uh, you, Tony, and John um, in in your place, and of course, Sister Nanaya from the river. Uh, but especially greetings to the participants, uh, to the people of the desert, to the people of the tree, to the people of the sea. Uh, living there on the back of the great crab. Um, we look to you for inspiration. And when we gather, even in this electronic way, we bring our dead with us. And we ask that you grieve with us over their loss and seek promise in what they have left us. Thank you. Uh, and it almost uh, need not be said, but it is a, a matter of uh, great grave concern for uh, First Nations people all over Australia that when we're in the company of our First Nations brothers and sisters across the globe, uh, often we are the ones whose language that has, has been taken from us and we've not been able to, uh, we're not able to converse in the same way. Um, what I wanted to uh, commence the discussion today um, uh, about is, is the, the notion of the, the symbolic effect of treaties, given um, that in Australia, in the state of Victoria and, and in the Northern Territory of Australia, there, there are serious steps being taken to embark on this process of, 
of entering into treaties. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm prompted to ask this question because I watched an interview um, with uh, 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 Justice Williams uh, not so long ago in which he was talking about his, uh, his uh, uh, knighthood and what that meant for, for him personally, but for also for his, his whanua and iwi. And, uh, and I, I would ask each of you to, to um, comment uh, as you see fit as to uh, how treaties fulfill a, a, might fulfill a symbolic role uh, in, in the modern uh, discussion. Um, would you like to go first, uh, Justice Williams? Uh, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, well, treaties signify some important things symbolically. Of course, the fact that it's a treaty means that whatever is agreed between the, those who... Um, agree to it um, are agreeing it nation to nation. It's a treaty, not a contract. Um, and sometimes the symbol is more important than the content. Um, but if you're, if, if, if the people of the indigenous people of the Northern Territory are anything like Polynesian people, then, um, then the content can be less important anyway. Um, what's important in the creation of a treaty is that it is an acceptance of a relationship between equals, between formal equals. And at least in Maori custom, and I suspect in indigenous custom in the Northern Territory, the relationship is the thing. It's got to have rules around how it works, but no indigenous peoples that I've ever had interaction with believes that you can reduce a relationship to some words on a paper and that's the end of it or even the beginning of it. So in my experience, we reinvent that relationship generation by generation, just like a marriage. We reinvent the nature of our relationships day by day, whatever was said when the contract was signed. So the symbol can sometimes be the most important and powerful thing. I'm not saying it's the only thing. Content does count, but, um, but the symbol means more than, uh, than the other side, which is a contractual culture for which reduction of rules onto paper is the point. It means more than that culture can conceive. Somehow we need to explain it to that culture. Thank you. It's certainly um, my understanding that the ritual and ceremony around the acknowledgement of, of uh, equality is something that people uh, expect and uh, uh, turn to as, as being a marker of the, the, the treatment as equals um, rather than something being gifted to them by the government. Uh, I wonder, John, if, uh, if there's anything that you would like to say on this subject. I agree with... Uh... Uh, Joe, in this regard, that it's about building relationships that are, are moral and, and just and finding ways to connect with one another through participation and mutuality, as opposed to the alternatives, which are terra nullius, conquest, doctrine of discovery, prescription, right? Those are unilateral doctrines that assume an inferiority on the part of Indigenous peoples, and building our nation on those fronts is inferior to building a relationship through participation, through mutuality, through um, working together, getting to know one another, figuring out how to live in peace and friendship and respect. Some of our, our treaties, and I'll just share a screen here briefly, are with wampum belts. And you can see 
the images there of um, the peoples linking their arms together. Uh, and there's the British on that one side with the boat being pulled ashore and 24 First Nations are gathering together to really lend a hand as it were to one another. And so that symbolism of mutuality and lending a hand and linking arms together is a critical part of the um, treaty aspirations that is you know, past, present and future that is taking our ideas from the past that are the best of our ideas, speaking in the present to really help us regarding the future. And so treaties have that, um, that uh, idea of, of joining arms together. Yes, um, I, I might just uh, expand on that uh, point of mutu mutuality, uh, Manaya. Um, certainly from uh, as these shores, we look across to, uh, to your country and see the way in which the government engages with, uh, with Maori people. And um, there appears from, at least from this uh, side, to be a, a, a different uh, level of respect to, to what is often experienced here. I'm wondering, if, is that something that has uh, existed for some period of time or the, the government's had to learn its way and is still learning? Um, are you able to comment? Yeah, well, uh, in part, uh, I think the government, gov successive governments have continued to learn uh, a lot through trial and error, a lot through um, being challenged. Uh, around uh, uh, the expectation that Māori uh, have long held because of our founding document, Te Tiriti o, o Waitangi, about what the um, responsibility imbued in that document required in order to honour the nature of the relationship. So over, you know, over many years, and, and our history is well documented in, in terms of uh, the way in which Māori have contested uh, successive governments in the way that they treat education, um, our language, uh, our land tenure system, uh, a number of political uh, uh, aspects. And there's been some hard fought uh, gains that have been won because uh, I think the, the, the challenge aspect of the way in which Māori have approached uh, their uh, aspiration and their desire to see uh, government step up uh, to its responsibility uh, um, is something quite, uh, quite significant and a key feature of our experience. I don't think we've got it right um, all the way through. I think we've got it more towards something better. Well, that's at least been the hope. And then there have been, you know, parts of our history where it's been altogether wrong and has not been a good experience and has been challenging. So uh, my reflection would be that uh, the, the, the point that we're at has uh, been a result of uh, a maturing relationship uh, and a maturing perspective of what the relationship uh, must look like, but a greater awareness that the presence and influence of Māori across all domains, many domains, has actually been a part of uh, that momentum alongside contested uh, spaces of um, views as to what the Crown or the government is or isn't, should or shouldn't be doing. Um, if I could um, offer a reflection, I, I think equally as important is the, the symbolism of a treaty and, and, and within the context that I'm speaking, it's within the, uh, in relation to treaty settlements. Uh, treaty settlements have a, have a moral uh, weight and that is, that is true for as long as the tribe uh, is very diligent and deliberate about imbuing in the psyche of their people what the origins of that, that treaty relationship, what, why that happened. Uh, so for my own area, it's imbued within my generation and we're the first generation benefactors of the most recent treaty settlement uh, that was reached in uh, 1996, because we've had a couple. Um, it was imbued in our generation about what our responsibility would need to be so that the expectations of that agreement 
could be translated to our kids, their kids, and there would be a, a, a source of truth as to the expectation of that, that uh, treaty agreement. So yes, it has moral weight, but it only has moral weight if, the, if it's imbued within the psyche and the architecture of the way in which the tribe lives and breathes uh, its identity that you can realize the full benefit um, of that treaty agreement, that treaty relationship, but also make sure that on the tribal side of the relationship, as well as on the government side, there's a, an equal standing around holding each other to account. Mm. I, at the risk of oversimplifying the, the last part of your comments, Nanaya, is it, is it fair to say that it's your observation that a, a treaty is only as strong as the iwi or tribe that uh, is seeking to enforce it? Uh, look, I, I think the experience here in New Zealand will demonstrate that those who have pursued the treaty settlement process, and it, it is a challenging process in and of itself, it does um, challenge some fundamental aspects um, uh, around tribal organisation, futures thinking, um, the, the way in which the tribe might better prepare itself for the future it wants to see, but also reconcile the, the past and the his, historical injustice, injustices that has occurred. So every tribe is very different in terms of how they see themselves stewarding through the, the total sum of those issues. But if you look at it in its totality, I would say that those who pursue a treaty settlement process will arrive at a point where uh, to have gone so far down that avenue to uh, not expect more, not push for more, um, I think does a disservice to the legacy of why tre mm. a treaty settlement process or a treaty settlement agreement has been reached. From the Crown side, and I can say this, what, what, I can say it from the tribal side because Again, um, my family have um, negotiated treaty settlements and I negotiated our treaty settlement, uh, our most recent one for Minya from the From the Crown side, I would say that uh, my observation is it's only been since uh, governments have tried to hardwire within uh, their architecture of how uh, they articulate the relationship for the period of time that they're in government and they formalise the nature of that relationship, that they can truly um, say that they are stepping towards uh, the type of uh, relationship that uh, Sir Joe was talking about. But it has to be formalised. You can't leave it to the goodwill of good people in government. You have to formalise some of that architecture, otherwise you're leaving it a little bit to chance. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, and I, I dare say we've seen the the, uh, the results of some of that uh, failure to hardwire in, in in a number of aspects of the relationship between uh, in, Indigenous Australians and the government. Um, I just want to come back to to um, John uh, for a moment. Um, the the consultation that's been conducted here in the Northern Territory with First Nations people and broader communities. Uh, indicates that there is some philosophical readiness for a different relationship uh, and an acknowledgement that the present one is not working. Um, I, I, I also detect that there's a sense that um, some people view it as the government should do this thing for First Nations people. Um, but of course, as you mentioned a, a moment ago, uh, and as, as Nanaya has um, spoken about, uh, Treaties are a two-way transaction, uh, um, and uh, I just wonder uh, if you could speak more on how those transactions should be viewed. Yeah, so there's a, a famous case coming out of the United States, 1906, uh, Wynans, which says that treaties are a grant of rights from the Indians to the government. And sometimes we get into this mistaken impression that treaties are about what the government might give us as indigenous peoples. And of course that can be a dimension of it, but it's not the only dimension of it. And so if we are in a treaty relationship, there is a can this idea of mutuality, something 
that is given, something is received on both sides. When I think about treaties in that light, um, it's, it's important then to note that when we think about our treaties in our own traditions, we had treaties with the natural world where we had agreements with the waters and the trees and the plants and the animals and the fish and, and those agreements with our brothers and sisters, those that came before us, uh, really marked how we were to live in our territory. And so when the crown came and asked to enter into treaties with us, we wanted to extend that invitation to live in accordance with those legal traditions, to have that kind of respect for those prior treaties that are in our territory. And I sometimes think that we forget as Indigenous peoples that we have that length and depth of treaties with the natural world. And then of course we had treaties with one another. Um, I'm Anishinaabe, as I mentioned before, we had treaties with the Haudenosaunee and the, the Dakota and the Abenaki and the Shawnee, et cetera, taking those ideas forward as well. That is to say that the treaty tradition needs to be seen in a much broader perspective, not just a crown centric perspective. And if we see that in that regard, then we do have something that we're inviting the crown to participate in, participate in a broader set of relationships that's attentive to the living world around us and how we draw our strength and sustenance from that world. And if our treaties don't communicate those points with the government, then we're not actually living by the treaties that we've agreed to with all of our other relatives that surround us. And so there is something that uh, is refreshing when we displace the crown as being at the center of this and see that there's a, not just a mutuality, but this intersecting uh, sensibility of, of, of responsibility for territory and responsibility for um, uh, those that uh, might be vulnerable amongst us, uh, the winged and the finned and the, the, the you know, those other swimmers, et cetera, that are around us. So, so that is what we try to take to our treaty uh, negotiations and, and, and cases that might go before the court. And of course, with one another, there's so much work to do in that way, right? To refresh, to revitalize, to see the resurgence of our own law within our communities so that people understand that treaty tradition is a, is a connection to um, all of creation that surrounds us. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, um, it's um, but for some time I thought uh, that treaties might be a, a, a journey to some new place. Um, but as, as I've grown older and, and had a few more experiences, I realise it's, it's about um, uh, finding the, 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 the place within. And um, uh, I, I, I wonder, uh, Justice Williams, whether... Uh, you might make some observations on on uh, John's comments, uh, particularly in your work with the uh, uh, Waitangi Tribunal. And I know um, that um, you you prepared a big report that dealt with cultural rights and and the way in which government ought to interact with uh, with iwi around those rights. Is there any comment that you'd like to to make? Um, look, I, I completely agree with John's analysis, and I think that's in some ways the key to this whole idea of rearranging the relationship with the state that we could call a treaty or we could call it constitutional, we could call it something else. Um, if it were done in accordance with my custom, we wouldn't call it a treaty, we'd probably call it a melding of um a melding of dna that's how we seal our treaties we share dna um and by doing that we um underscore the permanence of the relationship and the permanence of the mutuality of obligations um and so if we think about treaty making as a coming together of uh of treaty partners in a horizontal relationship, not a vertical one of supplicant and state or subject and sovereign, but a horizontal one of partners, 
then we each have to bring our best selves and our best game. Um, remembering who we are, what we stand for, what our values are, both sides, what our values are and how they need to be actuated. I hope that's a word. Um, in the new reality we're trying to build. Um, and that's, I think, th that was the point John was making that um, you see this, the point in history, the inflection point in history that the Northern Territory is at, that Australia is at, that we here are at, in terms of the relationship between Indigenous and settler is a really important point. And not just for us as Indigenous people climbing out of the burdens of an oppressive history, but for the settler too. Because, you see, their way of relating to the world is um, through the idea of property, that your relationship with the environment is expressed in terms of property rights, and that your relationships with each other are expressed in terms of contract entered into by autonomous individuals and if you reach disagreements then um, you hand the resolution of those over to someone who's called a judge who's not to you um, and the rule is the less they know about you the more qualified they are to judge um, and somehow those two ways of looking at the world have to make sense one to the other we have to remember as indigenous peoples that that's the way we look at the world. Even eat McDonald's. And they have to remember that the state, the settler has to remember that the way they see the world and relate to it has created some enormous problems. That Australia, more than many other places, is living through right now. So this inflection point is an opportunity, yet another opportunity to teach the settler about having good relationships with the planet, with our ancestor, our relation, the planet, and with each other as relations not transactional relationships and contractual relationships, but real human relationships that are inherent in the indigenous way of doing these things. So here's yet another opportunity. The last time in your place was sort of 17 and 88 through to the, you know, the 1900s, I guess, in the Northern Territory, where you taught these white people how to survive in these environments that they simply had no skill to, to survive in, here's an opportunity to teach them how to be good citizens, good descendants of the earth. So you bring that to the table at this inflection point where actually the survival of the human species is pretty much up for grabs. And that, make the, sorry, no, go ahead. No. Well, um, so when, when we do when we, when we do this treaty dance, all of us, we have to realize that what we're bringing to the table is in some ways a better way of relating to the world and each other. And don't be shy about that. So it's a help for them. It's a plus for the other side of the table. And to realize that what we bring to the table is the prospect of legitimacy. in a place in which legitimacy has not existed since 1788. I mean, moral legitimacy, not legal legitimacy. That's no judge is going to say the Australian government is illegitimate, but moral legitimacy is something the settler craves and indigenous people must make them pay for that. It mustn't be sold cheap. So those two dynamics are at play. And the last point I want to make, sorry, I'll end this speech that's been too long, is the treaty isn't the point. 
the treaty is a way station to the point. And the point is to survive as peoples, strong in our languages, in our ways of relating to one another, in our laws, in our beliefs and our principles, optimistic in the prospect that we can teach those who are ignorant about them the value of them, as well as reminding our children that they are to survive. So that my great, 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 great grandchildren will speak my language, will remember my stories, and so on and so forth. If the treaty is not walking me in that direction, it's not doing anything. It's a trick. So um, I think sometimes here at home, we thought the treaty settlement was the point, but it ain't. It's the way to the point. And the important thing is to keep the point very firmly in mind, particularly at this inflection point in our history where our, our very survival is at stake. Thank you very much for, the, for those words. Uh, it's, a, um, it's an approach that I have um, borne in mind for a number of years, that what, what we need to be thinking about as First Nations is where we want to be in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years and what's, what state of health and spirituality and happiness and cultural well-being uh, we, we want to be in at, at, at that time and how do we get there and what role do treaties play in achieving that? Yes, uh, think 500 years, not 50. Mm. Yes. And so one of the things I notice is that while there, there is, uh, to a large extent, a cultural resurgence occurring in, in Australia, in First Nations, um, off our own back, largely. Um, there is a, a largely a, a reluctance to let go of the, the conspiracy of silence, as it's been coined, over the past atrocities that have occurred in this, in this country uh, in the way that people, our people have been dispossessed of our lands and uh, our, our culture overrun. Um, and I, I know that in Victoria, they are conducting a, a Truth and Justice Commission, the Europe Justice Commission. And I, I wonder if, um, if uh, John first might um, just make some observations about the, the impact of the, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Peoples and whether that had any, any discernible impact on the, the relationship between First Nations and, and the government in Canada. So like all countries, we've had numerous commissions of inquiry for 30, 40 years, dealing with many aspects of Indigenous peoples and their relationship to the state. We had a Royal Commission in 1996 that produced five huge volumes. So we had a, a report into misser, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, but it seems to be that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was focused on our residential schools has been the one that's made the greatest impact. And that impact occurred because we heard from people, Indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast about their experiences in residential schools, both their resilience and what they were able to take forward through that, not being defeated by it, but also the trauma that was experienced in those schools as well. And I think it opened some people's eyes to what was hidden before, even though there were many reports before that. And there was 94 calls to action that were put forward. And those calls to action weren't just focused on government, which I think was a real key, right? The, the focus was to the healthcare systems, child uh, systems, to museums and businesses and universities and law societies. And, and in other words, civil society was called upon in these calls to action to step forward and take action to uh, redress some of the challenges that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uncovered. And so I've seen more action in the last 
six, seven years since the commission made its report than I'd seen uh, in the previous 30 years before, because it wasn't just government, right? In other words, creating constitutions, creating treaties is something we all do. It's not just something that two negotiators do in a distant room removed from the rest of the population. If a Truth and Reconciliation Commission can call upon citizens wherever they're situated to find ways to create relationships of friendship and peace and, and, and understanding um, you know, where they are, it, that's been a really significant uh, development for us. So the fact that in the Victorian process there in Australia, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is attached to the treaty process gives me some encouragement having seen the, uh, the development in, in our recent experience here. Um, thank you, John. I just wanted to ask Nanaya, are there, are there points in the recent history of uh, New Zealand where you can, you can point to and say, well, these, these acts or these events had a, 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 an impact and, and showed a, a watershed moment in the, in the development of the relationship, or is it something that's occurred piece by piece over time? I would say piece by piece over time, but the nexus of the, the movement was certainly um, catapulted by, by particular events. So for example, and actually, Sir Joe's better at um, uh, talking about this, re this particular reference point, but you know, the uh, desire to, um, uh, to push further around our expectations around language preservation, you know, and the, uh, again, it's a, it was a contested space. People challenged what wasn't happening in our education system, what wasn't being recognised um, in society. They marched, they brought a petition to parliament. And then as a result of that kind of juncture, some things happened and, it, and some things with or without the, the, the Crown or the government. Um, the beginning of the Kohanga Reo movement, you know, stories uh, around a simple language nest approach beginning in a garage and then replicating itself in this ecosystem and, and this network of champions who were grandmothers and mothers, uh, you know, and kaumatua who said, well, our language will not die. So I think we had a lot of things that really then became a springboard and it fertilized action. And that action was um, like a, uh, a series of momentous uh, uh, movements uh, or waves of change that it got to the point where it would be ludicrous for any government to ignore the, um, uh, their part in, in responsibility and trying to respond. Now, I, I reflect on, uh, on, on language as a critical part of any Indigenous culture uh, because it is... Um, it is quite key to expressing who we are and how we think. Um, you know, and then we've got, just recently we had a, a Royal Commission uh, into uh, sexual abuse and that's unveil unveiled a whole lot of systemic issues around children in care. Again, that'll be, that will be another platform to change, fundamentally change the way in which we uh, looking towards vulnerable children in the way that we need to respond to children who need extra supports and care and really reverse the old way where the state uplifted children to the role of community uh, and how we reinvest back into our, um, our own systems of well-being, what we could uh, re-envisage or re-imagine a care um, uh, ecosystem to, to better look like and then redefine the role uh, of uh, the state and government services. So yeah, I'd say it's incremental. There've been strong signposts or 
strong points of action that have actually catapulted a, a series of other things. Um, and in, in my view, um, that, that wave or the, those successive waves of action have brought us to this place where we are. I mean, treaty settlements, a treaty settlement process was gained not because the government thought it was a good idea at the time. I think the government got to a point of uh, realising that uh, they would be contested in the courts on a number of fronts and they needed to have another way forward. So the another, other way forward was the treaty settlement process that we now refer to that some 24 years kind of in its maturity. Um, but having, when I think about our treaty settlement process, the good and the bad of it, um, I, I, I am of that generation who hold out hope uh, that the, bra the courage and bravery that was required about 20, 20 odd years ago to go down that path as imperfect as it, it was then and remains to some degree now, as imperfect as it was and is, it is still a pathway by choice and by definition and by commitment uh, that the Crown and those, uh, those tribes uh, can move towards re reimagining, revisioning, reshaping the nature of their relationship. And if I, if I lean towards uh, the points that uh, Sir Joe was making, um, be brave enough to ensure that that has a very futures focus that is more confident uh, about uh, the potentiality of what was vested in that treaty settlement. And, and, and that's, that's a future I see. Mm, thank you. Um, uh, the, talking about incremental change um, and the and the taking the opportunities that are presented to us as they arise, uh, as well as driving our own systems of law and governments. Um, I, I wonder what role. Um, the, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and the working, working uh, group, I think, that the New Zealand government has established to take that forward, um, uh, will have um, going forward uh, for uh, Māori people. Um, I, I, I might ask you whether you've had um, uh, any thought about, have any thought about that, uh, Justice Williams. I also note that there's a there's a, a referral to the Law Commission, which um, Justice Fata is undertaking in relation to the ways in which uh, New Zealand law and Māori law may uh, be better understood to fit together. I, I hope I haven't wrongly characterised it. Um, are, are those types of uh, future uh, uh, mechanisms for engagement, the things that may uh, uh, allow better understanding and better respect for rights uh, in the way that you're talking about uh, our people leading in this, uh, in, in the, the current environment that we're in? Um, well, I can, I can talk about the place of tikanga of custom in the development of uh, New Zealand law. But on the on the issue of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I will always defer to our honourable foreign minister, and so I will give her the first uh, space before I pick up the second topic. Okay, so so on the declaration. I, the challenge with uh, signing up to international laws is, is having a domestic commitment to giving effect to it. And it took New Zealand like it took Australia and Canada some time to actually uh, agree to the declaration. And I think uh, in New Zealand's experience, uh, we had to take the next step, which is uh, committing to a national plan of action uh, because uh, the opportunity for New Zealand having matured uh, across a range of fronts required us if we were going to um, 
uh, sign up to the declaration and have a national plan of action and ensure that we were accountable across the range of government initiatives that actually left itself exposed to being criticised by Māori or being advanced with the support of Māori uh, as, a, as an important and critical uh, part of our project. And I say project because um, we're not starting at a point of perfection here. So New Zealand uh, agreed and expressed that the, you, uh, in New York uh, that it would develop a national plan of action. It commissioned a, uh, an independent working group to give some advice uh, to the government about how that might be considered. As you may or may not imagine, that received vociferous debate uh, that was anti uh, because they felt that even by virtue of uh, committing to a national plan of action in this report that the independent group came out with, it was a step too far for New Zealand's um, appetite. Uh, I still believe, uh, though, uh, that the, national, the nationwide conversation about Indigenous rights is furthered by advancing a national plan of action in relation to the, the, the declaration. And I say that with a level of confidence knowing that uh, there are a number of uh, reforms currently underway uh, initiated by government uh, that require tempering and, and um, I guess, Mutual collaboration, um, perhaps some contest, but actually working with and alongside treaty partners. And the only way that we're going to get there is if we start. But if we get too freaked out by starting and then or, or set, set the bar too high to say, well, we won't start until we're in a place of perfection, then we'll never reach the potential of um, working towards achieving the articles of the declaration, but more importantly, modernizing and redefining the nature of the relationship between treaty partners. And so I am in very much in a mindset within the context of this government for this time, that there is merit in drawing um, towards, drawing from and towards the declaration in a way where it can inform a government about how to better uh, uh, set, a, um, set some targets and objectives around improving uh, the nature of the, the, the treaty relationship between the Crown and treaty partners. Can I just uh, jump in there before but, Joe talks about Tikanga for a moment? Um, it, it is the case, as uh, Kirsty was just posting in the, the chat function, that we have legislation now implementing the declaration in both a federal and provincial uh, sphere. And I'll just share uh, briefly the screen that shows you the outline of that legislation. The federal legislation here is, says the purpose of the act is to make the laws of Canada consistent with the declaration. And there's an action plan that's attached to that as well as an annual report to parliament. But British Columbia goes one step further and uh, you'll see that number seven there is decision-making agreements. And so what's happening is uh, the British Columbia government is working with First Nations to create agreements where First Nations through their own inherent authority can assume the powers of a ministry for the purposes of environment or children or intellectual and cultural property or whatever the case might be. And, and what's, what's really going on is First Nations are now working in government, almost like a shadow attorney general or a shadow department of justice drafting laws to make sure that the laws of British Columbia are consistent with the declaration. And, um, and, and that's, that's representing a ground change here in the last um, sort of uh, year and a half to two years. Also share another screen just to uh, make another point, which is, um, there is um, action happening in the United States where tribes themselves are implementing the declaration. So here's a toolkit from the University of Colorado and the Native American Rights Fund 
um, directed with and to and from uh, First Nations there, and, and what uh, to see you know, tribal resolutions endorsing the declaration, wholesale adoption, or and then rights to cultural language. Religion. In other words, what First Nations governments are doing is they're combing through the declaration and saying, yeah, we want that piece. Here's how we interpret it so that our own people are protected from our own people, right? That there's a sense of a check and balance within indigenous governance. So it's not only the case that we would hope that the federal and provincial governments implement the declaration. We also hope that it's picked up in a local way and you know, rights to life and liberty and spiritual association and employment, um, that those things are protected when we also um, make decisions with uh, our own nations. And so I'm really encouraged by that braiding of international law, domestic law, and indigenous law. Um, all three of those pieces are coming into play as the declaration starts to gain more traction in a legislative sphere and in a First Nations sphere. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite encouraged by that approach too. So the approach proffered by our uh, independent working group put the Treaty of Waitangi as our other layer uh, of domestic context and to really, uh, I guess, have the declaration uh, as the overarching uh, objective and then the treaty uh, and then within the context of the treaty, if I go to um, uh, our context, it would enable tribes in the, uh, to articulate from their, uh, I guess, perspective, how they could better reach towards the aspirations of the declaration, otherwise it would feel quite far away. Um, and so we're on that journey uh, and we're currently consulting on the National uh, Plan of Action. And we're currently, uh, and, and when I say consulting, this isn't the Crown consulting, this is uh, consultation, um, both of in, Indigenous groups leading consultation and the Crown leading consultation in order to bring uh, some of this thinking together. Mm. And the um, very interesting developments, which uh, uh, I, I've, I know uh, there is uh, interest here from certain First Nations. I don't think that they're anywhere near as advanced as you are there in, in British Columbia, but um, certainly people are similar thinking and working as, along similar lines, I think. Um, uh, Justice Williams, the, um, the, the question uh, I, I raised before about uh, Tikanga and the Law Commission referral, uh, and you, you were going to make some comments, I thought, about how how um, uh, Maori law and uh, New Zealand law or English law um, uh, have worked or may work together better in the future. I think that's what you, what you were going to say. Yeah, I think that's what you told me to talk about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I guess the, um, the first point is to pick up on Minister Mahuta's uh, comment that um, developments in our country tend to be incremental um, as a political culture and as a general political culture. New Zealand is pretty skeptical of big, bold statements, um, which is why the prospect, for example, of a charter, such as the Canadian charter in New Zealand is relatively limited. Um, but over the course of the last 40 years, I suppose, um, there has been quite a substantial shift in the way the country views itself. Uh, when I was a child, a young child in the 60s, you could be forgiven for thinking that we were anchored just off the English coast. And you could also be forgiven for thinking that Australia was somewhere close by and that we were slowly drifting towards New York. And as the 70s carried through faster and faster in the direction of the US would be, I mean, when we went to the movies as children, there would be uh, a thing at the start of the movie 
where God Save the Queen was played. Um, Nanaya, you won't remember this. You're too young. <laughs> and everybody stood up. That's how weird our reality was then. Um, and what's happened over the last 40 years is that we have begun to sail, it start, it started to drift and then to sail back into the Pacific and to remember that, at least in our context, we are a Polynesian country at the bottom of the Polynesian Triangle and that our sense of place is tightly connected to that location even if we are inheritors of the legacies of the West as well. Now, and this has happened and I mean, no, no one's, there's, there's been no kind of general decision that this should be the drift of our country. It's been partly population based. The Maori population is 16%. That's a big indigenous minority. Um, that makes a big difference. And is one of the reasons why the lack of a charter to look at the Canadian example has not been fatal to the project. Um, the current cabinet has, is it 20% Maori? 20% Maori ministers. In the justice sector, there are five related ministers, corrections, justice, police, um, and so on. Only one of them is white. The others are either Maori or Polynesian or other Polynesian, other Pacific Islanders. So you can see that that creates a bit of a shift in the way the country views itself. When I was a kid, when we sang the national anthem, uh, which in English is a terrible national anthem, I must say, just doesn't, because you can't work out what the English is saying, it's in such old style, um, it, it was in English. Um, and in the 1990s, it changed. And now we sing the national anthem in Maori and then in English. And you know what? No one said do that. It just happened. Um, and eventually, even the rugby union agreed to it. That bastion of conservatism. So you see, this is the, the way in which Maori culture seeps into the system. And it's going to pop up in the law eventually, usually last, because the law is the most conservative. I mean, the common law is the most conservative of all institutions. And we're going through that process now where, um, you know, for the last 20 or 30 years, Parliament had injected all of these provisions about Maori values into our statutes, um, starting off with environmental statutes, then education, then child welfare, then justice, then intellectual property, and so on and so forth. Eventually, the courts caught up and thought the common law, the non-statutory law of the country should probably reflect our dual legal heritage too. And that's, that's where we're at, but it is, it's a glacial process that began not because the judges are progressive, but because the judges are catching up. I mean, in my country, you can't get into a Maori language course because it's full of white people. They are full of white people because everyone says that's part of who I am. I'm a Pacific Islander too, even if I came from Ireland or England or whatever, right? Now, and that's why we can have these discussions about UNDRIP and so on without a charter. Um, it's a ground up kind of discussion. So as you say, and now I'll get to your point, Justice Fata has been sent, a Maori from Te Arawa, has been sent, a High Court judge, to the Law Commission to prepare a report on the ways in which the law should take cognizance of and um, implement or actualize or activate tikanga Māori, Māori custom. How do we do this blended dualist system when the bulk of the judges are white and know nothing about it, yet there's a broad consensus that tikanga Māori has a fundamental place 
in the way in which the law should develop in our country. The Supreme Court has said it, the Court of Appeal has said it, um, judges up and down the system say tikanga Māori is a part of the law of New Zealand and we must take better cognizance of it. So we are just feeling our way through this. It's, full, it's a process, a project that's full of risk because they might screw it up. They might kill tikanga in the way that English judges 500 years ago killed the common law. But that's the risk you take if you want to engage in a properly dualist system. And that's the only way you can do it in my country because it's so small. We're just, you know, we're a quarter the size of British Columbia. So the idea that you can have the indigenous people living over there and the white people living over here and they can have their system and we can have ours is, would be extraordinarily difficult to implement just because we're so small. So we've got to come up, we've got to come up with a system that finds a striking of balance between the two systems. And that's, that's a challenge. Just as it uh, should be here, and we've, we've got some um, matters coming up in our High Court, which touch on, on those issues. Uh, oh, really? Yes. Um, I, the, the, the conversation that we've been able to have today has been um, fantastic. I, I know that um, everybody's time is short and uh, I, I think our audience are extremely grateful that you've made time in your very busy days to, uh, to, to come to this panel and discuss these, uh, these very, uh, very difficult issues. One of the um, things I, I said to you at the, at the, uh, in preparation for this panel was that we weren't going to take any uh, questions, but, but try and uh, have a bit of a conversation about the matters. But there's been one question that's come up on the Q&A function on this, uh, this panel, um, which I might uh, ask each of the, the panellists to reflect on uh, <clears throat> before we close. And, and that is, um, the question is, how can we have treaties in the Northern Territory when the endless intervention slash stronger futures legislation and massive human rights violations towards First Nations people are still occurring. Um, how can we ensure that these injustice can, injustices can no longer occur? Um, my initial response to the, the first part of that question is, um, yeah, is how can we not, but, um, I know that treaties aren't the only answer to those, those ongoing difficulties of government intervention in the lives of, uh, of the uh, First Nations people of the Northern Territory. I wonder um, if any of the panellists would like to comment on that, that live issue of the need to think about the future, um, notwithstanding the injustices which uh, weigh heavily upon us all uh, in the present. So Anyone? I just uh, support what uh, was said earlier that we need to be careful to not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, that is, there are things that can be done right now as we're working to something better. And I'm in mind of a couple of examples here. When I was a little kid, I would sit on the counter as my mother would make bread and I would see her add all these dry ingredients together, um, you know, the, the flour and the sugar and the baking uh, powder, et cetera. But then she'd hold out this little grain and said, see this, if I put this in this mixture, it'll make the whole thing rise. And she was referring to a little bit of yeast, right? So putting that little bit of yeast in the mixture had a huge effect on the rest of that um, uh, recipe. And I sometimes think that people are like that and these issues are like that, that sometimes it's just a little bit that actually does make a huge difference in the scheme of things. Uh, that's not to um, undermine the importance of, of, of strong top-down action where that's needed or court cases or legislation, but it's to recognize that it, law is something we do 
It's not something that's just done to us. Law is a verb, it's an activity. As, as an activity, as a verb, at least in our language, then we have a piece of that. And, um, and, and, and there has been some empirical research done that the more we participate in these um, attempts to deal with these injustices through these seemingly abstract issues of self-determination, there are so many better outcomes that we receive in a socio-economic sense. There's a Michael Chandler who's done some work at the University of British Columbia that says the greater degree of self-determination that Indigenous peoples exercise, the lower the rate of youth suicide. You think, well, how can a treaty process or language revitalization uh, lead to uh, better outcomes is because people have a sense of hope and a sense of possibility by being involved in these processes that they can have a say in what their lives are about. And, and you know, it's, it's not a, a magic um, um, uh, elixir. Again, it's something we have to work hard at, but as people feel participatory around these uh, things, those degrees of self-determination actually end up with uh, longer life expectancies and greater educational outcomes and higher rates of employment. And, and again, this has been research to, to be able to show these connections like through this Michael Chandler's uh, research that we see. So, um, you know, it is, it's, a, it's a stark question, right? All these injustices and then this big hope for the future, but it's not necessarily this dichotomy because this hope for the future is all sorts of many different actions to address uh, that question along the way. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to jump in and give the last word to Sajoy. <laughs> but I, I, I would say, I mean, I've had the privilege to witness courageous leadership through a range of different types of adversities. And um, the thing that is in common, and actually, if I even draw back to my own travel routes and uh, how um, through the history through history and time progress has been made because adversity is always there. It's never going to go away. We can have a view of what utopia looks like, but we will always be challenged. Our kids will be challenged. Their kids will be challenged. Sure, it'll be different challenges. But the enduring feature of the courageous leadership that I've witnessed had actually three simple ingredients, hope, faith, and love. Hope, faith, and love. I, I have seen legal action being taken when advice was you haven't got any stool to any leg of a stool to stand on, and yet uh, the, the government of the day was brought down to its knees and recognised that it was wrong. I've seen um, lead courageous leadership where um, the prospect of Maori. Uh, being so bold enough as to contest uh, the commercial fishing quota system and, and the way in which Māori had an interest in it, that they didn't have any hope or show of contesting that space against the Crown, yet they did. But it, the ingredients were very simple. And it's not legal. <laughs> it's actually tribal. It's, it's Indigenous. It's worldview. And it's hope, faith and love. Because there's something inherently deep within the perspectives that we bring to the domains that we are in now that is different. And I, I guess to loop back around to the opening statements of, of um, uh, Sir Joe, which I agree with absolutely, there is something deep within us that is enduring, that has transformed and endured and, and will continue to transform, endure and innovate so that we not only survive, so that we flourish and that we take that perspective wherever we are as, as frugal as it may appear it's probably the wealth of what we have to offer uh, in a world that is full of conflict and full of uh, a range of challenges um, thank you thank you Nanaya. um justice williams is there anything you'd like to add hmm um, yeah, uh, great comments, both of you. I, I agree that, um, that that perfection can often be the enemy of the good, 
And the trick in this is to understand what the good looks like. Because, you know, the more important a principle or a value or an objective is, the more important it is to have the confidence to know how to compromise to get it. And um, if, we, if we have a clear view, as clear a view as we can of our destination, then we know what the good looks like and what we're agreeing to and how what we're agreeing to contributes to it or does not. So yes, whakapono tu manako met the aroha, faith, hope, and love. And you know what? This is the hardest thing of all and the thing that Nanaya talked about, leadership, leadership. Our leaders need to know what the hell they're trying to achieve. Once they know that, as the co or the elders that uh, Nanaya talked about, once they come to know that, they will know what the good looks like and they will have the confidence to grab it because a treaty is a way station on the journey to perfection. It isn't perfection. It's just a means to that end. Um, thank you. I, I thank you all for your words of hope and, and, and wisdom and um, uh, great insight. Uh, we have run out of time today, sadly, and I, I think this conversation could go on for many more hours. There's uh, uh, parts of it that we haven't uh, yet been able to tap into, but uh, the, the hope um, is there for people uh, in the Northern Territory. Um, and, and I will make the observation that there are many uh, great leaders uh, here who have um, have very strong uh, and clear visions as to where they and their people um, need to go. And um, I, I'm hoping that uh, they will have the uh, circumstances in which to um, to pursue that, those visions. And I, I'm sure that they're doing it as we speak. I just, uh, I, I propose to close this uh, panel now, but I would ask each of you um, to, uh, uh, sign off uh, in terms of your own protocol and and, uh, and thank our audience for their participation and, uh, and staying on mind. Uh, perhaps, John? Um, grateful for this time to be with you and uh, wish you all the best in your work. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, Minister? John. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and uh, share some for Karo. Thank you. Um, and Justice Williams? There's this um, simple prayer that jumped into my head uh, listening to the comments that have just been made. Um, it's a prayer offered by someone launching their canoe first thing in the morning um, that expresses nothing more than uh, gratitude for being at one with their place. And um, I think it's a good prayer to end from at least my perspective. Um, thank you very much. Before I close, I, I wish to extend uh, my gratitude to um, to uh, the ANTAR, the Australians for Native Title and Reconciliation, and in particular their um, CEO, Paul Wright, um, uh, Kirsty Gover from the Melbourne Law School, and uh, uh, Eddie Cabillo, um, Lara Kierman uh, from the uh, Melbourne Law School, uh, and all those people who worked very hard behind the scenes to make sure that this event could come to 
Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attendance today and thank you very much to the panelists for, for such um, uh, an important and um, deeply interesting discussion. I, I, I hope to catch you again sometime in person uh, before too long. Um, yeah, and perhaps uh, Justice Williams can sing us a song at, at, at that point. Okay. Thank you.